Excuse you don't drink coffee? coffee? No. I don't trust anybody who doesn't drink coffee. I, yeah. This interview's over. <laughs> My name is Nick Barilli, and I'm traveling the country to sit down with some of the biggest Latinx artists in places that are meaning to them and help tell their stories. We'll talk about their journeys and careers and explore issues of identity, culture, discrimination, and representation. This is Seen. Hey everyone, we're back. I am on campus at Cal State Northridge, also known as CSUN. I am on my way to meet Eva Longoria, a true multi-hyphenate. Actress, director, producer, entrepreneur, philanthropist, so many different hats. The place she chose for us to meet is Jerome Richfield Hall. Let's go find out why. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Pleasure to meet you. How are you? I'm good. Good. So Jerome Richfield Hall, of all the places in LA that we could have met, why is this the place you picked? You know what, CSUN is a very special place to me. It's where I got my master's. And this particular building is the Chicano Studies Hall. And CSUN was the first university to have a Chicano Studies program. Wow, it's I the know that. first in the country. And so it's the best in the country. This place was probably the place I grew most in, in my life. What does it feel like to be on campus again after, uh, it's what, 10 years ago or 15 years ago? When you got your master's? Not, I'm not that <laughs> old, Nick. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but it was 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait, I thought I did my research. But it's not 15 years ago, but actually makes me exhausted because I was exhausted the whole time I was here. You were actually attending here while you were working on Housewives. Yeah, yeah. So I did night school. I would finish filming and come here 7 to 10 at night and then go home and then do it all again, be on set at 5 a.m. And it, it fills my heart with my Mexican pride. Well, I want to talk more about what it was like during those days and why you picked your kind of studies, but let's go inside. Okay, and, and come inside, go, because go there's the lane. most beautiful mural that made my heart swell every time I saw it. <gasps> oh my God, it smells the same. Really? Look, so this is Ballet Folklorico. Uh -huh. I always wanted to do it as a kid. We couldn't afford to do it. My mom was like, it's too expensive. And so when I got my master's, we had to pick an art. I chose Ballet Folklorico and I danced. Oh my God, this is my advisor, Cristina Ayala Alcantar. She's amazing. She's still here. But I want to show you the mural. Ta-da! Wow, this is the mural you were talking about. This is the mural! That's Dr. Acuna. He's the godfather of Chicano studies. His book is what made me want to study Chicano studies. It was called Occupied America, and it was the history of our people. It's crazy that growing up in Texas, and I grew up in California, that that's not part of our curriculum. That's part of the struggle with Chicano studies is is getting our community to learn our history. It's a fight. They're taking it away in Arizona, in Texas. I mean, they're saying you should not learn this. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of this, this whole movement is to make sure that we do learn our history. I met you briefly like 10 years ago. I'm sure you don't remember, but it was a beso and you were honoring the farm workers and Dolores that night. Yes. And I was so inspired that at a moment in your career where all the light was on you, mm -hmm. you took that light and used it to empower others. What point in your career did that really become a mission for you? It's probably when I moved to LA. The pride in California is very different. Like the word Chicano comes from California. The movement originated in California. And one of the first people I met was Dolores Huerta. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, I wasn't famous. I wasn't, I was just asking her questions about her legacy and her work. And she said, you know, one day you're gonna have a voice, so you better have something to say. Wow. And I never forgot that. And then, you know, later on to actually have that platform to be able to bring attention to causes that are near and dear to me is, has been an honor. We'd love to go into the classroom. Yes. As tired as I used to be walking into a classroom, like the minute I walked in, I was like, 
I'm gonna learn. I was like, that's the benefit of being an older student mm -hmm. is that you know you're eager and you're curious and you're like a sponge as opposed to being like 21 and you're like, I just want to graduate. Right. <laughs> If you had to look back, what do you think that time taught you about yourself? You know, that you're capable of anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is you have more time in the day than you think. Right. It's the amount of time you waste in the day. The other thing it taught me was you're never too old to learn. You're right. never too old to finish something or to go back and do something mm -hmm. or to try something new. And so that's what really, I think, the biggest message that came out of it was like, I was like, I'm going to... I'm gonna do this, I can do this, I did it, <laughs> you know? How did that set you up for all your future endeavors? Because now you're a multi-hyphenate, not only do you act, you direct, you produce, you're entrepreneur, you're a philanthropist, like. Well, I think for the most part, like I said, my thesis became the basis of my foundation. And so to have research really backing your initiatives to say, I studied what our community needs and that's where I'm gonna focus my energy on because I wanna make sustainable, effective change. That's where it probably helped me the most. It also made me a little bit more credible my political activism, right? Like I knew what I was talking right. about. I knew the history. I knew the policies. And I continue to stay educated on that because, you know, the fight never ends for our community. And so it's, you know, it's done a lot for me. I heard that one of the things that powered you through was, uh, was coffee. Yeah. I haven't had coffee since I was a PA in college. So you don't drink probably, coffee? No. I don't I, trust anybody who doesn't drink coffee. I, yeah. This I interview's over. <laughs> <laughs> this interview's over. Come and see my coffee machine. Look, it's here. Ta-da! So, so this is the actual coffee machine from yes. when you're here. This is my coffee spot, you guys. It tasted like shit. I can't believe this is still here. I don't think they've changed out the coffee since. But are we I doing this? Take, I, oh, we did. Let's buy one. But yeah. Oh gosh, it takes credit cards. I, I don't think so. it took credit cards back. Maybe it takes Apple Pay now. Totally takes Apple Pay. Not connected yeah, to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be the whole video. It's just two people trying to get coffee. <laughs> Y'all, we've got to taste this coffee. Ah. So, like, what happens? Wow. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Okay. Oh man. Taxi <laughs> back. <laughs> Smell that. You don't care. It smells like coffee. <laughs> see, to me, it smells like. Late night. That's what it smells like. All right, we gotta get you one, and then we should go have our coffee break. I'll show you where I actually used to sit outside. Would love to. Welcome to the courtyard. So this is where sometimes you would hang out before class? Sometimes. I was usually rushing, but the times I did get to have a little bit of time, this was, this was it. It was crowded. Every single seat was taken. Let's take it back. I would love to get a little bit of context in your life. I always love in interviews pretending that it's a movie of your life. So okay. it's like. Who's playing me? You're playing you. I'm playing you're, you're, me! You're, you're, <laughs> oh my God, I've always wanted me to play me. <laughs> <laughs> that opening scene that comes into Corpus Christi, into your childhood home. Yeah. Uh -huh. What are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we smelling? I'm from Corpus Christi, but we, I was really raised on the ranch, which is okay. outside of Corpus Christi. So we grew up with cows and chickens and pigs. And, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, we were from the ranch. <laughs> My swimming pool was the cow trough of water. That's where we're like, we're so lucky we have a swimming pool. Um, Corpus Christi is a really small town in, in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a Mexican neighborhood, and so I remember, you know, never really feeling Mexican because there was no need to say it. We were all just in that neighborhood together. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the third grade when I tested um, into a gifted and talented program. So I had to go to a school way across town. Take me to that first day, that first day you're getting on the bus. On the school bus. On the school bus yeah. to go there. I remember getting on the school bus and every morning, to this day, this morning I ate this breakfast. This is the same breakfast I eat every day. It was a bean taco. Mm -hmm. No cheese, just a flour tortilla and beans. Every morning I eat for breakfast. And my mom would make it for me and I'd take it to school and I'd eat it. And so I got on the bus with my bean taco. Everybody was staring at me and everybody had a Pop-Tart. 
everybody had a Pop-Tart. And I go, oh my God, what is that? And they looked at me and they're like, what's that? And I was like, it's the bean taco. Don't you get it? Doesn't everybody eat a bean taco? Mm -hmm. And they were like, no. And I remember a little girl on the bus going, she's Mexican. Mm. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know the word. I was like, what? Um, so that was the first time I felt like other. I was like, oh, oh, okay. And I think there was like two Mexicans in the whole school. So you come home from, from school that day. Yeah. What's that conversation like with, uh, with your mom? My mom? Oh, I beg begged my mom to buy Pop-Tarts. I was like, Mom, you gotta buy Pop-Tarts. I don't want a bean taco anymore. She was like, we're not buying Pop-Tarts. You know, here's two bean tacos for mm -hmm. tomorrow. And so, yeah, I just remember going, oh my gosh, I'm different. And I didn't know why. What was it like at that moment, kind of straddling both worlds? I mean, you're, you're in a neighborhood that's predominantly Mexican. You're going to school that's predominantly affluent and white. But I also think it's confusing because to them, by the way, not to me, because I didn't have an accent. Right. I'm white passing. So they're like, you don't look mm -hmm. Mexican. You don't right. sound Mexican. And it was kind of the same reception I, I had when I came to LA. Hollywood. Right. Yeah. They were like, oh, so could you do that with an accent? And I'd be like, I don't, I don't have an accent. Or could you do it in Spanish? And I didn't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, well, how are you Hispanic and not speak Spanish? I'm like, there's a lot of us that mm -hmm. don't speak Spanish. Uh, I've since learned it. But at that moment, coming to Hollywood, I would never get the Latin roles because I wasn't Latin enough. Right. And then I wouldn't get the white roles because I was too Latin. Right. So I was, I played a lot of Italians. Speak about uh, your parents' decision to not teach you Spanish in an attempt yeah. to, to assimilate, because yeah. I feel like that happened to a lot of oh, yeah. uh, people that grew up here. Yeah, especially in Texas, you know, I'm ninth generation American. I never crossed a border. The border right. crossed us. Right. And so when people go, you know, go home or, you know, like, no, we, we are <laughs> This home. is home. This is home. <laughs> My family was under five different flags without ever moving, mm. you know, from Spain to Mexico to France to Republic of Texas to America. Mm -hmm. And so so for a lot of Texans, you know, assimilation was key. Assimilation was important. So my parents felt that. They said, we don't want you to be discriminated against because you speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. So they spoke Spanish to each other, right. um, but they wouldn't speak it to us. And we were an English only household. And I never learned it until my adult life, until I married a Mexican. Right. <laughs> when was the first time that you turned on a TV or watched a movie that you felt seen as a Latina and you felt proud to be Latina? Um, it was probably like Salma Hayek and Desperados, or it was like pretty late in life. I remember Rita Moreno right. in West Side Story, but I wasn't Puerto Rican. So I kind of didn't understand it. I was like, oh, mm, no. And, you know, they brown faced them on that original movie. Right. And I remember even Rita talking about it, of like, yep. why are you making us so dark? And mm -hmm. I just thought, I actually remember thinking, they're a weird color. But yeah, growing up, it was very, very few. Yeah, not, same. I mean, when I first saw La Bamba, that was like the first time oh, that yeah, I was like, and again, I, yeah. I wasn't Mexican, but I was like, the Latino experience I could yeah. relate to. So yeah. it was like. But you know, I was lucky growing up in Corpus with Selena. You know, Selena was one or two years older than me. And so growing up with her and seeing her trajectory, you know, we used to see her play at quinceañeras and, and weddings, you know, mm -hmm. so it wasn't a big deal. But once she started blowing up and becoming big, I thought that I really saw myself in Selena because she was a Texican like I was. And she really embraced being Latina. And so it was just like, I was like, yes, her, I want to be like her, you know. Right. Speaking of quinceañeras. 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 My, my uh, accent comes and goes. Uh, <laughs> wanting to do yours, uh, yeah. you, you went to go work at Wendy's. Yes. Uh, what was that like? Yes, it was crazy because my I wasn't old enough to get a job, so I stole my sister's ID and I went and applied and got it. And I didn't want to tell my parents because I knew they'd, they'd get mad. I worked there for like two weeks without them knowing mm. until one of my teachers came in and she saw me and she was she told my parents like, you know, she's a little young to be she's working. She's a little young to be working. Right. And my mom was like, did you go get a job? And I said, yes. And so, I mean, it was legal. All she had to do was I had to get permission from my right. parents to work. So she, I was like, mom, please, I want a quinceanera because they wouldn't pay for it. My my family was like, my mom and dad were like, your sisters didn't get a quinceanera. You're mm -hmm. not getting a quinceanera. I mean, they're weddings. They're ex as they're expensive, expensive as weddings, yeah. right? And I was like, yeah, I want a quinceanera. So I got a job to make, you know, make my own quinceanera. And I did. Yes. Where does that work ethic come from? My work ethic comes from my mom. My mm. mom is like, 
I still to this day think I don't do enough because mm. I just see what my mom did without a cell phone and without all the the technology that we have today. She was super, I don't know how she did it. Yeah. She was always there. And so I don't remember a day without without my mom working as hard as she could. And she was always very efficient. My mom would say, I'm gonna go into the bank, you're gonna go into the store, get the tomatoes, I'll meet you at the cash register. I mean, she got everything done. She maximized the day. She was a natural producer. Yeah. I think about that from my mom too. I mean, my mom was a single mom, went to school, and she was a professor, and she did all this stuff, and she had a job, and then she came home and helped me with my homework. Yeah. And I, like, I look back and I'm like, how did you have time to do all that and still be present in my life? Yeah, yeah, but super moms. It was a different era. What was the point where you started to think that being an actress or coming to Hollywood was something that you wanted for, for you? Uh, it was overnight, one day. Like, I didn't, I didn't dream of it. I didn't grow up with it. We never went to the movies when I was young, so I did, we didn't have that. Oh, look at the movie stars. Right. Celebrity culture wasn't a thing. Right. And so role models growing up for me was my family, my right. mom, my sister, my right. aunt. Like, I didn't really look up to Hollywood people. I didn't even know what that meant. And I'd never really been outside of Texas. And so in college, I ran out of money my senior year, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I want to finish. I want to finish. So my girlfriend was like, hey, you should join the scholarship pageant. And I was like, what's that? And she said, it's um, it's like a beauty pageant, but you get a scholarship, you win. And, and I remember like, I just wanted to get fourth place mm. because fourth place was like books. Right, and cover then, your, your yeah. school. So I was like, if I could just get fourth place, okay, that'll be taken care of. And so they called, you know, fourth place is, you know, Jane. And I was like, oh man, I, oh, now I'm not going to win anything. And they go third place and I won. I won the whole thing. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So I was happy because I got to pay my senior year. But because I won that pageant, I had to be in another one. And I was like, oh no, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to. <laughs> right, I'm just trying to pay the cost. I just wanted to be in this one. And then I had to go to the next one, which was Miss Corpus Christi. And I won. And my mom was the one that was like, you, that's it. No more pageants. Like, this is not the way I, you know, mm -hmm. I want you to go. But in my prize package for Miss Corpus Christi was a trip to Los Angeles. And I just thought, oh, that'd be fun. I didn't think, oh, I'm going to be an act, like nothing. Right. One of the reasons to come was this, like, talent competition. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do this talent competition. But I really just wanted to go to Hollywood Boulevard and walk around and Santa Monica Pier. <laughs> And when I went into the talent competition, I won everything and all these managers and agents wanted to sign me. And I was like, Wait, what do you mean sign? I don't like, even know what, what that, that means. means. And it was 1998, which is like Ricky mania, mm -hmm. J-Lo mania. Mm -hmm. And it was like to be Latina in the industry in that moment, right. a lot of doors were opening. So all these agents were like, this would be great. You, you know, we're gonna, and I was like, what, what do you mean? I didn't even know. They had plans for you, you didn't have yet. They had plans and dreams for me I didn't even know of. Mm -hmm. And and I was lucky, you know, I really assigned with somebody good. And, and I was like, I literally called my mom on that trip. And I said, hey, I'm gonna stay in LA. I'm gonna be an actor. Just like that, one day, one day. And she goes, okay. And I, because I had just finished college, my mom was like, well, you'll be fine. You can get a job anywhere. You have your degree now. And I said, right. yeah, yeah, I'll just go get a job. That was it. Literally one day. And I just never went home. Wow. <laughs> That's insane. I, I had $23 in my, in my bank account. And I was like, okay, I need a job. And I went to a temp agency to get a job. And the temp agency ended up hiring me to work there. And, as a headhunter. As a headhunter. Yeah. Which you ended up keeping even after you got young and restless yeah. for... Yeah, because I made more money headhunting than acting. And so I was like, oh, okay, let me just keep doing this to pay my rent. And I would do my headhunting job out of my dressing room at CBS. And I would be on the phone and, and on my computer. And then they're like, Eva, camera's ready. And I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And I also had to hide the fact that I was an actor from the corporate world because I always frowned upon mm -hmm. actors because they were like, oh, you're just a dumb actress as mm. opposed to like, no, I'm I'm smart and totally capable of this job. Right. And it wasn't until like, I mean, two years I was doing both jobs. And about two, about two years in, one of my clients was like, are you on Young and the Restless? And I said- From your voice or they actually saw it? I think they saw it oh. they saw the name and they go, there, are you, you know, there's a girl on Young and the Restless. I go, I know that's not me. I don't know who that is. I don't, I don't know who that, like I tried to deny it as long as I could because I didn't want them to think I was a dumb actress. It was like the opposite of, I was like, I don't want a publicist. I don't want anybody knowing, you know, because- I was Because like, this is actually paying my bills over act, here. Yeah, and it's I don't gonna want affect this. my job job and I don't want it to affect my job job. And finally, the third year of Young and the Restless, I was able to make enough money to, to quit my, my job job. When was that moment that you knew you made your parents proud with your career? Oh, so many. You know, my mom and my dad are just, 
they've been proud since I was in band, you know, or I was a cheerleader, they were proud. But I think, you know, when I got my star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, that was something tangible that they go, right. oh my God, that's what happens to big Hollywood people, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a star. And I got that star almost 20 years to the day that I moved to LA. And oh, I, wow. And I remember being on Hollywood Boulevard when I moved here in 1998. And I, I went to Hollywood Boulevard and I go, you know, one day I'm gonna have a star here. And it was like 20 years of the date, almost to the exact spot. You manifested it. Yeah, and so I, they were really you know, proud of me in that moment as well. And the other time they were most proud of me was when I got my master's. Mm, I was gonna say, how did they feel? Because yeah. you come from a family that really values education. Yeah. How did they feel when you yeah. told them, I'm gonna go get my master's yeah. in Chicano studies? Oh, my, my mom constantly bugged me about it. I'm the last person in my family to get my master's. Wow. It definitely, you know, when my parents came here for the graduation ceremony, I mean, my mom was crying. Mm -hmm. She was like, wow, you know, it was it's important. It's important, our education was very important to our family. And so that was the other finest moment for them. Mm -hmm. I would love to talk about, you've been directing for a while. You've been, <laughs> you did Black Is, Jane the Virgin, a bunch of like different stuff. As you're working for your first feature directing role, I was reading that uh, you really had to uh, set yourself up for that role, for, mm -hmm. for Flaming Hot. Mm -hmm. Can you walk me through that process? I heard that, uh, that a couple of people kind of like helped you along the way. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh. so many people, so many people. I, you know, I've been directing for 10 years, but this will be my first narrative feature length because I've done the documentary yep. feature, you know, so it's so funny. Like you, you never know you're not qualified for something until you go in for a job and somebody tells you, well, you haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, well, I haven't, I haven't done it till you do it. Exactly. <laughs> so I had to work twice as hard just to get into the door and twice as hard on my presentation and twice as hard on my pitch and twice as hard on my vision. So I was practicing my pitch over and over and over and over. And, and I was practicing my pitch with my friend, Brian Tannen, who's mm -hmm. a showrunner, a big showrunner. And I said, okay, Brian, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, do my pitch. And so I started and not even one minute in, he goes, okay, I gotta, I gotta stop you. I gotta stop you right there. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, I want you to walk out the door and come back in with your white male privilege pants on. <laughs> Right, you're gonna come into this room and assume you have the job. You're not coming into this room and asking for the job. You're not coming into this room and begging, like, oh, please, please right. give it to me. You're coming in and saying, when I direct this movie, this is what I'm gonna do. My vision for this movie is going to be this. And it changed not only that pitch, but every job going forward with that. Um, it changed in my life, the way I approach anything that I want. White male privilege is alive and well, you know. Any man mm -hmm. that comes into that room is like, assumes he has the job, of course right. he has a job. You'll be silly not to have me. And it really just, like, something clicked in my head. And I went into that room and I had all the confidence in the world. I had every answer. I had every idea. I had every piece all put together and presented in a way that I had to make it undeniable. That's the only chance I had. I was a woman. I was a woman of color. I was, first you know, time. a first-time director. Right. Like, everything's against me. So what do I got to lose? And, and it worked. And I got the job. Being underestimated is the best position mm -hmm. to be in. It's the best position to be in. Like, let's go prove ourselves. We have to prove ourselves. And so every day that I showed up during prep and on the set and, and, and the filming of that movie and the editing is like 110% because I have to prove that I can do this to people. I know I can do it, but I got to prove to everybody else that I can. Mm -hmm. Talk about your production company and now being in a place where you're consciously mm -hmm. hiring women yeah. and minorities as opposed to uh, what's been going on, Ignoring which is them. unconsciously, yeah. you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, well, we have this problem, you know, how do we get here? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, one of the reasons why we got here is because people just hire the people that they're used to working with. Yeah. So we have to be really conscious about yeah. switching that. By the way, I don't think it's like, I don't think all of it is systemic racism. I think a lot of it is unconscious bias. Right. A lot of it is, I've worked with Bill and Tom and Bob. I'm going to hire Bill and Tom right. and Bob. Yeah, because you're familiar. I'm familiar with them. Right. I know they can do it. I remember producing Grand Hotel, and um, they gave me a list of DPs. They're like, oh, here you go. And it was, you know, Bob and Bill and Tom. And I was like, uh, do you have any female DPs? And they go, oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, let's uh, we'll get back to you. And they brought me five names, right? Mm -hmm. And I hired a female DP. So it wasn't they weren't against the idea. Right. They weren't like absolutely not. Right. You know, they were unconsciously 
ignoring that. Mm -hmm. So my production company, our mission is to produce with purpose, specifically building a pipeline of talent in front of and behind the camera of Latinos. Mm -hmm. You know, we exist, we're here, we're in this industry. So I want to be able to create that, those job opportunities for them and give them that experience. So when they go to the next job, they go, I have done this. Mm -hmm. I've already done this. I know how to do this. And so that's the greatest thing about being a producer is, is job creation. Mm -hmm. Like I remember we were on the set of Telenovela, my sitcom, and they were the sets were going up. Um, they were, the construction crew was putting up the sets and I was walking the sets with a friend of mine and he goes, isn't this crazy? You had an idea and now 300 people have a job? Yeah. And I was like, Oh my God, yeah. I mean, everybody from construction to your right. crew to dry cleaning to catering, the way one show affects the economy and affects people's economic mobility is, is really fascinating to me. And so I enjoy that part of it. Uh, when I see a show like Kentified mm. be canceled, mm -hmm. when I see a show like One Day at a Time be canceled, like I feel like, okay, we're taking steps forward, yeah. but maybe the yeah. shows aren't necessarily getting the promotional push or other things to really be around for yeah. seasons and seasons. How do you think yeah. we can take that next step? There's so many factors to those things. I have been on TV shows that have been canceled. I produced telenovela, we got canceled. I produced Grand Hotel, we got canceled. Like mm -hmm. I come from the mindset of build it and they will come, right? If we give a show to the Latino audience, they're gonna show up. And that has not been the case. And why aren't they showing up as a number of, of issues connected to that. It's the same reason why we don't vote, right? Are we not engaging in our audience the way we should be? Are we not welcoming them to the platforms that these shows are on? Mm -hmm. Are we not telling them when it's on and how it's on and where they can watch it? Um, and at the same time, are they not showing up because Hentified is about a Mexican-American family and I'm Argentinian? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. You know, we're a very factioned right. group. We're not right. monolithic. And I think our community focuses a lot on the differences because we want to prove that we're not monolithic. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea of like finding our commonalities. Mm -hmm. You know, we have themes within our community that are universal, right. you know, family, tradition, mm -hmm. culture, food, language. I mean, we all speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a little bit of ownership on our audiences to show up. If, if something is is out there for us, show up. I don't care what background you are, mm -hmm. support it. And then at the same time, I agree, you know, a lot of times we don't get enough bites at the apple. So we get one hentified a year. Right. But why don't we have 10 shows on the air? And if one gets canceled, it's not such a casualty to our hearts, right. you know? A lot of it's educating the gatekeepers of our industry, you know, who are mostly white male. And so we have to say, no, 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 La Llorona is going to be a really great, scary movie. You, it's going to resonate with everybody, not just Latinos, mm -hmm. you know? And especially with the, the way media is consumed today and made today, there's so many many options and so many outlets, the only way that you're going to break through as a new show or a movie is through innovation. And the mm -hmm. only way innovation happens is, is by diversity. And so you can't keep going back to that same talent pool for mm -hmm. the same story because you're going to get the same movie. Um, but you can still do Romeo and Juliet through the eyes of a Latino is a very different story. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do Hamlet through the eyes of a woman. It would mm -hmm. be very different. Not only do we have to educate the gatekeepers, we got to change out the gatekeepers and get us a seat at those tables. For sure. You've accomplished so much already on the acting side, directing side, producing side, entrepreneurial side, activism side, political side. What What's left for, for you to accomplish? Like, where does your focus go? <laughs> oh my gosh, on all of it, I'm going to continue to do all of it. I still have so much I want to act in. Mm -hmm. You know, I still have so much I want to direct and produce. Um, political activism will never go away as our, you know, communities are still underserved and underrepresented. Mm -hmm. My foundation is going to be my life's work. That's going to be my work forever. And I think, you know, um, being a mom has really prioritized my life. Mm. You know, everything, you know, he's the center of my universe. So everything now revolves around that priority and motherhood. And, and so, I want to continue to do it all. The last question that I have, mm -hmm. and it's a question that we've been talking about in our communities for a while, in terms of waking up the giant. Mm -hmm. We're 60 million U.S. Latinos, mm -hmm. yet we don't necessarily have the, the political capital that should come with that. Yeah. As someone who's been, you know, advocating for the last mm -hmm. 20 years, what do you think is, what are some of the keys in order to... Yeah, I mean, I think it's voter education. I mean, I never say I speak for the Latino community. I always go out and encourage the Latino community to speak for itself. And the way you speak up for yourself is by voting, mm -hmm. uh, by participating. 
civic engagement, being involved, being informed. We did a survey of if people even knew the district they're in. Hmm. Do you know what district you're in? And they're like, oh, ah, no. Do you know who your local representation is? And I think a, a, a big misconception for our communities is that, you know, every four years is a general election for president and they participate. But the what really affects them day to day is their local, local government. Right. You know, who is on your school board? Who is on your city council? That is what's going to affect your everyday experiences. People go, I can't solve world hunger. No, but you could donate to your local food bank. So that homeless guy that you see at your coffee shop every morning, you could help him. Mm -hmm. Because I think the misconception is you have to be a politician to be political. Right. And that's not the case. The greatest power in our democracy is in the people, is in the person, is in the vote. And so, you know, continuing to tell our community that. I can't wait till the day that we have a Latina president. I know. That would not be fun. We'll paint, paint the white. You? No. We'll, we'll paint the White House pink. Rosa Mexicana. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for, for you. your time and, and for everything you Thank do. Thank you. Thank you for my shitty coffee. <laughs> I will take all the credit for that. It's a wrap. Thank you to Eva Longoria for taking us on a trip down memory lane. I really appreciate it that we're actually on campus where she went back to get her master's in Chicano studies. I feel like it has a lot to do with the purpose that she has for life. I think that's what I resonate with the most, the fact that she's using her power to give our community a voice. That's what the series is about. These are the people who are using the spotlight on them and actually flipping the script and using it to tell stories of our community, tell the stories of people whose voices we don't get to hear that often in the mainstream media. And that's what inspires me. And hopefully that's what inspires you too. And hopefully that's what we keep doing in the series. Until next time.